So my name's Lauren Paz. I'm a master gardener with the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in Yavapai County. Um, tonight we're going to be talking about fruit trees, everything from buying, planting, and most importantly, maintaining and trimming. And if you do it right, you too could have fruit this big. <laughs> So growing quality fruit um, in this area requires a lot of planning and obviously long-term commitment because your trees need to be maintained every single year. And at the same time, we're always fighting off a host of, of insects and variety of pests. So our annual uh, cultural practices that you're gonna commit to once you have a fruit tree is pruning, fertilization, irrigation, weed control, IPM, which is integrated pest management, and then thinning the trees and harvesting. Um, and different trees have different requirements in terms of how they're gonna be pruned and when to plant them. So your site selection is the first and most important thing. Um, the soil needs to be very deep for the, to support the, tree, the root of uh, the tree. It needs to be well drained. And when they talk about productive soils, it's soils that are not just native, but in, in some concept compost and uh, more nutrients put into them. Um, we do our own composting. So when I plant, I'm constantly putting one third compost in with my native soils. And you want the native soils because they have the local microorganisms that help the decomposition as well. Um, we're going to get to how deep to go when we talk about exactly planting. You also have to figure out where your cold air is. So when you, when you think about it, if you have a sloped yard, cold air goes down, hot air rises. And so you want, and the cold air is denser than warm air. Um, so you really want not to put a fruit tree at the, at the bottom of a slope because that's where your cold air is going to congregate. And by doing that, it is more likely to hit freezing temperatures earlier or fruit needs warmer uh, weather to produce its, its blossoms and so it could delay the growth and the, the ripening of your fruit. Um, we prefer the gentle slopes rather than steep slopes. And if it's flat, it's perfect. You don't have to worry about it. Um, you do want to try to avoid those frost pockets, which could end up at the end of a bottom of a slope. Um, or maybe where wind is blowing at, if you're in an area that attracts certain air currents, you have to worry about that. Wind can also be deadly for fruit trees because um, in spring, if you have high winds, you could lose all your blossoms as, as the flowers come out, they get blown away and, and you end up with no fruit on your tree. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about frost protections because you may not have an option where you're gonna plant it in your yard that protects it. So we have here um, a couple of ideas. Um, the top one is building basically a cold frame. The white is called frost cloth and we've talked a lot about that in our prior classes. Um, a medium to heavy weight frost cloth will protect plants down to 10 to 15 degrees for an extended period of time. Um, if you're gonna buy frost cloth, I suggest you go online to a garden type supply store because our local box stores carry one type and it's usually very thin and it protects more like bugs and light weather but not hard, hard cold freezes. Um, for our trees, the damage would typically occur at a 28 degrees Fahrenheit or lower for a sustained period. So if you have that six o'clock in the morning little freeze and it's only a, you know, a short freeze, it may not do the damage, but as we more get into winter, it will. Um, you wanna maintain your bare ground um, cover. So when you put mulch on um, the ground, say underneath the tree, it might prevent weeds, but at the same time, mulch keeps the ground cooler. And so it, it sort of has a reverse effect because you want warmer ground also for your trees to grow in. Um, you can use incandescent lights. Um, I know that putting up holiday decorations um, on my, my uh, fir trees, 
the birds flock to it and, and hide out there at night because they stay warm. And the same would happen if you put lights, incandescent lights on your fruit trees. It would provide a barrier of warmth. Um, if you think about, we always look at Florida with their uh, citrus. When they're having a frost, they put fans out to make sure the air is circulating. That's quite expensive, but you know, if you only have one or two and you have a fan system in place, maybe you can harness that energy. Um, when you're thinking about planting a tree, um, many people like to graft. Uh, grafting is a class in of itself. Um, but the reason a lot of fruit trees are grafted is because they bring um, technology from one type of a tree to another, which could be disease resistance. It could, it could create smaller fruit trees rather than the larger ones, and that gives you um, it's easier to handle a tree in a, in a rural or a, a residential area and you actually produce more fruit for the size of the tree. So you can get more bang for your bucks if you would. Um, precocity being that it can get, you can get very early um, uh, flowering and early um, uh, fruiting if you're after that. Um, and then it has to do with the sky on which is the bark, it's uh, basically a young shoot or twig that can be grafted or eventually planted. So all of these are things to, that um, people who have had plant or fruit trees may consider doing and attaching it to an existing fruit tree and, and as far as just grafting it on. So if you're going to buy from the store, which is most likely what the novice person is going to do, you should consider just buying the bare root trees um, because what you're then looking at is the, the quality of the roots. When you buy from a box store, and we're not downgrading, you know, getting trees there, you don't know, you're not going to be able to take the roots out and inspect them before you buy it. Um, they might have been root bound at that time. You're looking for roots that are sprawling and not twisted around that you would get in a container. Um, your roots should be looking fresh and not that they've been soaked and maybe starting to rot or again being hardened because they've been in the container too long. Um, there's several um, manufacturers that sell online and you can order and they'll ship them to you. And these trees aren't going to be very big. They may be like this big when you get them with a root system about this big. They ship them in a box with sawdust shavings on them so they stay moist. Um, and when you inspect it, if you, if you believe there's an issue with the roots, um, they'll, they'll let you ship it back. So you're not, you're not really stuck with something that you plant and then you find out six months later that you've got a, a dud. Um, the other thing to think about here is our freeze zone. So there is a, the plant hardiness zone map. Um, I have X marks the spot for us. In the Chino, Prescott, and Prescott Valley area, we are a zone 7B, and that's the USDA zones. There are other zone um, that you might hear about. Um, one has us as zone 3, but it's a, more of a localized Arizona zone. Um, and if for, for us, a zone 7B means temperatures getting not below 7 to 10 degrees on a normal basis. Um, in Dewey Humboldt, it's 8A, so it's a little bit warmer uh, just because it's a lower elevation. I find that in, Yava, in Prescott Valley, we actually stone, I live in Stone Ridge, and that is a lot warmer because we have some of the valleys that we, we don't get. Uh, we're at a certain elevation, but the elevation changes within Stone Ridge. Um, you also want to select, you want to determine if you're going to do the self-fruitful versus non-self-fruitful, which is the cross-pollination. If you, for instance, are going to do pear or apple trees, you have to have at least two. They don't self-pollinate. Peach trees and nectarines will self-pollinate. So if your neighbor has an apple tree, you can plant one too. It doesn't have to be immediately next to it, but it has to be within 
I'd say wind distance that the, the pollen will carry. Um, and then you want to select varieties that may, and you don't have to have the same apple tree, for instance. You could have two different types, and you might want to select some that the fruit will mature at one time versus another so you don't have all your apples coming due at one time. I think uh, one of my master gardener friends just had 600 apples this year from three trees, and they all matured at the same time. And she's running out of freezer space. So, um, so the chilling requirement is very important, and you can find that. Um, again, we're not, we never promote any business, but Dave Wilson's Nursery has a resource online. Um, DaveWilson.com and the product category and the fruit trees, they'll give you as much information as you need from um, chilling factors. Um, many of our trees need to be chilled for so many months to kick them into production. So their buds do formulate in the spring. Some of our trees, the buds formulate in the winter and then they blossom in the spring. So in Verity Valley, the chill factor, based on the number of days that it would be below 32 degrees, is 600 to 750 chill hours in Prescott. In Prescott Valley, it's about 750 to 1,000 chill hours. And that's the average for how cold it is in our area. So if a tree, for instance, needs 1,200 chill hours, we would never get there. So um, be careful for that. That's an important quality when somebody says, I planted a tree and I don't have any fruit on it. Um, and um, we're not going to really talk about cherries and pomegranates and quince, but they will grow in here, but they have a much uh, lower chill requirement than, say, an apple tree. So when we talk about um, first planting, it's pretty easy. I'm gonna. Ha we have a picture of a bare root, and generally, what you do is you don't dig the hole any deeper than when you gently place the tree. You, you you can dig down maybe six inches or more, but then refill it again. And for us, we're gonna dig down just to see if there's rocks, because we live on granite, yeah. and you don't want to place your tree where the root structure will all of a sudden be root bound because the roots are, or the, the rocks are right below you. So a lot of times we'll dig a little bit deeper then backfill into it. So you're really putting your tree where the, the base of the tree will be even to the ground, but the hole is bigger. And so this is area is where you're gonna put half native dirt and say half uh, compost or enriched soil. Um, Typically, I'm not referring to the miracle Grow bags. I'm talking about more uh, the dirt that you might get from Prescott dirt that came out of Willow uh, Lake. So, And then this is an interesting picture. Um, he's planted it, but immediately he starts pruning his tree. This is just a tiny little tree, but what he's doing right now is making the tree decide where its dominant leader is or if there's going to be a dominant leader. And the way he's cut this, one would expect that the branch is now going to go out that way. So he's creating the opportunity for an open center in the tree. And we're going to talk about why that's important for the variety of trees. I would say that's probably an apple tree, just the where they made that cut. So once you plant your tree, um, most trees, you don't start pruning until several years later and they, they have developed a crown and then you're doing it for cosmetic and thinning just so that you know, the branches will grow evenly. You're taking out the cross ones in between. But you really start trimming your fruit trees the day you plant them. And that is because you're going to determine, like a peach tree, you want it really, really open and you really don't want a dominant leader. Pear trees, you're going to have one dominant brand leader going up. They're more traditional. If you cut that dominant leader, uh, it may not grow at all. And an apple tree, like that one, you want the dominant to, to slide off to the side to keep it a little bit open. Um, 
on an annual basis, um, you're going to remove any of the dead or diseased branches. And in any given year, they say not to take more than 25 to 30 percent of the canopy off. Now, when you talk about dead branches, that doesn't count because they're now not in, in play on that tree. And the reason it's 20 to 30, 25 to 30 percent is that, and this is really true for any tree, more cutting can actually stress the tree out and cause it to be uh, more susceptible to diseases. Um, and especially when you're cutting the larger limbs, um, it take longer to heal, and therefore that open sore is more likely to be infected over the time period of its healing. And it could take two to three years. So you really never want to take more than one dominant limb off in a given year. And you don't want to take more than 25 to 30 percent of the canopy off in a given year. Now that's not going to be too hard in the beginning of a plant because it's not going to have a big canopy. Um, couple things to think about. We always think about not to prune the tree in the summer because it's active and you want it to be dormant. Well, winter pruning, heavy winter pruning, which is what we typically do, could cause very vigorous growth immediately in the spring. So new foliage comes out of that, especially in larger limbs, and you get what I call sprouts coming up, these leader branches all over the place. And um, then you're going to have to start removing those, so you're, it's competing with itself. And more energy is going into growing those limbs than the fruit. And what you want to do is put the energy in the fruit. Now, sometimes you can't help it, but if you start very, with a very young tree, you should not have to cut off a major branch. Um, so some, when, when, is the, when is the recommended time to prune that? Um, I prune between December and early March because I'm finding in the last couple of years that the buds are starting to develop by the end of March. Most of uh, Chino Valley's fruit producers have been trimming mid-March. Um, but I know this year they were doing demonstrations and they moved it up several weeks. So you really want to watch as soon as you see some budding process coming out, you need to get it done by that time. Um, summer pruning is okay um, if you're just trying to do some, uh, one of the things that happens with fruit trees, all of a sudden they get a lot of weight on them and it's, it's bearing down the branches. Um, if you decide that you've got some excess weight, it's okay to take some of the smaller perimeter branches off at that time. And during that process, it's not going to start developing its excess green growth because its energy is already going into the fruit. So I'm going to have I have some concepts, and then I have a couple pictures of, of trees that are in the process or have been pruned. So there's two, two ways of pruning fruit trees, and one's called the modified central leader, and that's where we saw the first picture where he took a brand new tree and he sliced it. And you slice at an angle where the bear is coming out is where the new growth is gonna go out. So how, if you cut it straight, you're just gonna have it continue to grow exactly where you didn't want it. So your angle is, like if it's, slice this way, the new growth is going to come out over here. So that angle gives you the definition of where you're trying to do that modified central leader. And this is important on apples and sometimes pears. Um, this is a picture of, and it's somewhat two different trees. This is actually the open center, but here you can see that this has gone off on an angle. So this probably was very early on cut right here. And this gives some more opening, so that's the idea of a modified opening is so the sun can get to all the fruit, so the fruit ripens consistently. The other concept is the open center, and this is generally for your stone fruits, peaches, nectarines, plums. Um, in this case, we are going to be cutting um, branches off, like here's an example that we're going to cut one here. We've probably cut one over here before. So it opens up at the top and it allows the sun to come down evenly amongst your tree. And if you think about picking fruit, you really never want your tr 
fruit tree to get so high you can't get the tr fruit off the top. That's a waste and the birds are going to come and peck at it. So your topmost branch should be accessible by a ladder. Um, this might be hard to see, but the modified central leader, what they're doing is showing over time. These are cuts, so this one got a cut here and somebody cut, cut here. So they're opening up here. Um, and you can see up there they're opening up, but it's really taking a pick, looking at your tree, and it's a, it's a work of art. And you start very slowly, and you're, you're doing one cut and seeing if it's opening up. Don't take all the cuts at once and say, oh my gosh, I did, did too much or I did the wrong branch. And you have to really follow these branches because you're not going to cut the branch, say, right here. You're going to take it down and cut it here because you're actually removing the entire branch generally if you're doing it on an annual basis. So as the tree grows, you're going to keep modifying its growth so that it's the most productive tree you can have. And I'd say if people want an ornamental tree, fruit trees may not be the right thing because you're butchering this tree every year. Um, the open center one, again, you can see the hash marks where they may be cutting, you know, and, and this is an extreme case, but you, they're trying to open this center up and let the fruit be around the perimeter. So I have an example of a tree that I've been helping a friend with. Um, this tree is at least 20 years old and up to five years ago was never pruned. So it was massively overgrown. Um, it is a peach tree. The peaches that came out would be no bigger than this and very sporadic. Um, my biggest problem with this tree right now is this top part, which is what I would call a central leader, but it's so tall and it's so weighty that it has actually had some breakages along the way here. You can see one. But we had so much work to do on this tree year over year that this year we'll be taking that top leader down. But, but you can see other than that, it's a pretty low tree, um, and it's, it's very full all around the edges. And in the last couple years, her fruit has been um, a lot more productive as far as the number. And with thinning, the, the peaches have started getting about this big and very sweet. So the tree's been able to put more energy into each piece of fruit. And this is an example from the opposite side. So you can see where that one leader is way out of line for that. And this is sort of close up, so it looks huge over here. But um, there's a little bit too much weight in here. But it's really sprawling flat. And we can get to all the branches to pick off the fruit. Now, for this one, because of the way some of the branches um, were let to be grown, we've actually built um, a cradle, so you know, two by four with a V, and we put them under all the major branches during growing season so that the branches don't go all the way to the ground. And giving the trees support like that when they're in their last stages of production is a great idea because it really saves the tree from, especially with the winds that we've had. And this is what it looks, this is in the dormant season, but this is. Uh, um, semi-dwarf Fuji, Fuji apple tree um, and this was on our professor's property and so he's been maintaining this tree but he gets a couple hundred apples a year off of this tree and it's sprawling but you can see he's he actually created an open center on it just because it got so big so the dominant branch had come out over here but he cut it off at the top because of the weight but um, it's, it's sort of hard to see without having the leaves on it. Okay. Um, but you can, you can see even this tree is, is pretty low as far as being able to pick. Um, real quick, so you can see, when I talk about a spur, 
in an apple tree, these are spurs. And this is where your, it, the spurs will generate the apples. So peaches have a little bit different. They, they come off more of the main branch. And also for peaches and nectarines, they have about a three year process. If they grow one year on a branch, they will only do it for another two or three years and then they'll, that branch will die off and they'll find another one. So if you're gonna trim and you have first time fruit on a branch this year, don't cut that branch um, until you notice that it's, it's diminished in, in its production. Um, we're gonna come to thinning in a little bit, but the other thing to consider for your fruit trees is how you're irrigating them. Um, fruit needs water to mature and to become you know, plump fruit and to be juicy. So you should have some kind of a basin around the base of your tree that it's not gonna be standing water that floods the root systems out, but can collect it so it's not running off. Um, drip line is fine. Uh, micro sprinklers that will uh, keep, you know, just a, a, like a wet sponge is a, a good way, not, not standing water. Um, make sure for fruit trees that you're applying water in the winter if, if we don't have a moist winter. I water all my trees at the first of the month if we did not have at least a half an inch of rain or measurable snow. And a foot of snow is one inch of rain. Um, mulching is good to prevent evaporation, but at the same time, it can keep the soil from warming. Um, the other thing is if, whether you're using mulch or any kind of stone covering, never let it go directly up to the base of the tree. Always have some dirt um, that's between the mulch and the tree base because the tree can start rotting, the base of it can start rotting. So, mm -hmm. So what do you recommend for topping the soil uh, instead of mulch? Uh, um, I use um, uh, synthetic wood chips and only because I'm into firewise and I don't want wood chips right next to my house or near my house. So the more synthetic looking chips and I don't, I don't do it very deep. I do it just so that it's a small enough la layer that I'm not getting weeds. Okay. Um, I find that rocks, is, and think of, if you do use rocks, a lot of people do, the darker the rock, the more they heat up. So um, if you are gonna use a rock, maybe a, a darker color rock versus one that's white and reflective. Um, now, the other thing to think about though, and I have this problem not with fruit trees, but our yard is full of different trees. And when I want to fertilize them and I have rock all over the place, it's hard to put fertilizer in your soil and in the top layer and water it in. So I have to use a liquid fertilizer to spray on my base of, on the, the ground surrounding the tree so it soaks in. Um, but rules of fertilizing is Three times during summer, I usually say Memorial Weekend, Fourth of July, and Labor Day. And those holidays sort of give you your three times a year. You really don't want to start any earlier than May because on statistically, 50% of the time we could have a frost on Mother's Day. So they talk about not fertilizing before Mother's Day because all of a sudden, the fertilizer will get the, the tree to start blossoming, the green growth. You get a frost and you've killed everything. Um, you really don't want to fertilize after the Labor Day time period, say mid-September, because now you're going to get into the colder weather and dormancy and you have the same issue or you're going to have a frost. And you really don't want to start producing fruit, you know, that time of the year. So uh, just a generic, it doesn't have to be any special kind of fertilizer, but fertilizers for trees. Um, and in this case, you can see that he's putting it around the perimeter and, and look at the can where the canopy is and that's where you should be watering, you know, in most cases and that's where you should be fertilizing because that's, your root system has gone out to the canopy area. Um, 
thinning your fruit when you have now your your tree may not um, produce fruit for the first two or three years depending on what kind of variety you have but it's it's really hard for people to do this but if you want good fruit you need to thin the fruit that's being uh, produced on the tree and most trees will produce way more uh, flowers and initial fruits than it's capable of, of maintaining. So if you don't thin it, you're going to get tiny little fruit that is not as, as uh, delicious and juicy as you may if the tree can put more energy in each one of the fruit pieces. Um, I have some pictures that we'll talk about or you can see. But um, so the thinning process improves the food quality and increases the size of the yields. When the fruit comes out on the tree um, in spring, and let's just say April, you'll see the buds. You want the buds, you want the flowers to turn into fruit because you never know whether the weather is going to, um, a wind comes through and you lose all your buds. So you don't want to start picking them off until you have viable fruit set. Um, when the fruit is about three quarters of an inch to one inch, and you can see that it's viable, then this is time to start thinning it out. Um, in this case, it's leave one, whatever cluster you have, leave one. If it's a large cluster, maybe two, but on opposite ends so that the fruit isn't jamming up against each other as it's growing. Um, peaches, they say three to five inches apart per clusters. And on um, apples, five to eight inches apart for, for apples because they do get a little bit, little bit larger than your peaches and your nectarines. And that will likely uh, reduce the, uh, I live on top of a hill in Prescott Country Club. So okay. I'm, you know, similar elevation as yep. you are in Stone Ridge. Um, and I'm at the top of a hill and I'm, I, one of my worries was fruit banging against each other. Right. And bruising. So that's why we're, we're taking. So you look at, this is, um, it looks like a peach or a nectarine, but that's what, how it started. And look at how it was thinned to, as an example. Um, apples usually come out in a cluster of five to six, and you leave one on it. Really? Yeah. Wow. Uh, and that's hard. That's hard for you. But what you get is a, a robust piece of fruit at the end versus much smaller and not as tasty. Um, and the picture of them trimming it, I think that's probably way late, but it's just at least it's a picture from how one is clipping it down. And you're clipping it um, down here as close to the base as possible so you don't have stubs left on it. Um, but that's definitely um, an example of how robust your, tr your thinning is going to be. Um, I have found in doing it, I, I can't bear to lose that much. So every year I've been doing a little bit more, but I've, um, I, I usually do an alternating. So one may be on the top and one might be on the bottom. And I wouldn't have thinned as I would never get to that much thinning. <laughs> Although that's what's recommended, and that's a personal preference. But it's definitely not, you're definitely clipping it rather than just twisting it off. Correct, because you don't want to twist because that could destroy the branch. Right. And that branch is, is expecting to produce more fruit on it next year. And if you, if you harm that branch, you might get less fruit. And ripping, you know, clean, you want to do very clean cuts. So you're, your uh, clippers should be very sharp so you're not also creating jagged edges or pulling any of the bark off. Um, I'm go we're going to do a YouTube uh, presentation on, I think we're doing pears. Um, but before we do that, um, I'm going to be, are you going to post this PowerPoint? Yep. Yeah. So this will be available, so you don't have to write all this down, but it gives you the hardiness zones, the Dave Wilson Nursery, which I'm sure you can just look it up on Google from that point. And it also has the chilling requirements. And the UACE publication is 
through the, it's on the Arizona web, University of Arizona Extension website. Um, and we have a lot of in general information on fruit trees at the U of A Extension Office website. Also, as a note, if all of a sudden you have an issue with the fruit tree, all of a sudden the leaves are browning or whatever, you can always take a sample of the leaves in a plastic bag, because we don't want to bring diseased things into the extension office. They will research it for you and let you know what they find out. If they can't solve the answer, they'll send it to the U of A, and they, then you'll have the ag department looking at it. They love to find out what's going, into our, going on in our areas, because we found that we had peach borers about four years ago in Stone Ridge. And we put out an announcement to all the people that lived in Stone Ridge that if you have peach or nectarine trees, beware that we found four trees that had peach borers and they will navigate to the next peach tree. Um, and we gave advice of how to treat it and we seem after two years to have eradicated it. So by sharing that information, they can spot where pests have invaded an area and, and how to treat it. And they, they pull bulletins out for people. So before I get to the, to the YouTube, which you may have questions afterwards, is there anything you have questions on right now? I guess my, my main concern is, like I said, I live at the top of a hill, mm -hmm. and we get a lot of wind. A lot of wind. And so is that even a good environment for me even to try to, to grow a Tree. Um, your biggest problem is going to be making sure that it's protected during its uh, bud setting, uh, fruit, fruit setting time. And well, I'm not in the valley, I'm at the top of the hill. I know, but it's the wind okay. that I would be more concerned about. Okay. And the wind can blow all your, all your buds off before they set. Once they're set, you're, you're going to be pretty much okay. So the same concept of using this frost cloth for protecting the tree in cold seasons. They have extremely lightweight frost cloth that allows 85% of the UV light to come in. And you may want to put its, um, if you're doing a peach tree, for instance, because it self-pollinates, right. um, you could put a light layer of uh, a canopy of frost cloth over it during its fruit setting time period and protect it. Um, if you have two apple trees or two pear trees covering up the canopy during its fruit production time means it won't self-pollinate and you won't get any fruit. Right. So I would say in that case you might want to start with a nectarine or a, a, yeah, well, a peach tree. Thinking of peach or nectarine. Yeah. So. Um, and at least you only need one tree to yeah. start with that. Yeah. So I'm going to get out of the um, PowerPoint and hopefully be ready to start up. Good morning, my name is Jeff Shalau and I work for the University of Arizona Cooperative Extension in Yavapai County. We're talking about fruit tree pruning today and I'm going to demonstrate some different techniques that we would use to prune deciduous fruit trees. But before we do that, something about the place where we are. We're in Chino Valley, Arizona and that's at about 5,000 feet elevation. It's an excellent area to grow deciduous fruit trees, but it has its challenges of which we'll talk about some today. This is an apple tree that has a modified central leader and it was headed at one period in time way up here and so it's got scaffold branches coming off of it and and then it doesn't have a pure central leader that goes straight to the sky it, um, it, it it's a modified central leader with scaffold branches arising from various places along it this is a, the traditional way of pruning an apple tree for backyard gardeners I often recommend that they just prune apple trees to an open center as well. This particular uh, cooperator wanted taller trees because horses are turned out here once in a while and, and uh, getting up above the horses was one of the goals. Also, with this tree, I probably made 10 or 12 pruning cuts on it of very small diameter material. 
and I think it's almost ready to go, which, uh, which means it's ready for the next year of growth. And it really doesn't take a whole lot of work with apples and pears if you can stay ahead of the pruning by doing it every year and even looking at it during the summer to make sure you don't have any breaks, uh, removing water sprouts, and just looking for any potential problems. Apples and pears produce their fruit mostly on spurs. Most varieties do. And here we've got some younger spurs that are just coming into production. And then as we look down lower on this tree, we'll see some older spurs. And some of these spurs are probably getting beyond their productive potential. This is the wine sap apple that we're working on again here. And you can see the fruiting spurs up and down the branches here. So this is where the blossom cluster will appear. And there will be five blossoms there. The center one is what we call the king bloom. And that's generally what's going to make the biggest piece of fruit. The other thing that's worth mentioning it, along the way here is if we do set a fruit crop, it is critically important to thin that fruit for about four to six inches apart per piece. And um, it's hard to do, but you need to tell yourself to do it. And I'll tell you right now, you probably won't do enough of it. And, and then you'll learn that uh, there's a certain amount of fruit tree pruning and thinning that you need to accomplish. Actually, the thinning of the fruit is very, very important. I'm going to be pruning water sprouts out of this tree first. And to reiterate, water sprouts really are sapping energy out of the tree. So one of the first things I like to do is take the, the easiest cuts and take the water sprouts out. So um, you can recognize them often because they'll have like a, a bloom on them. And if you rub them, they get shiny. So I'm going to take out those water sprouts. There's a real inwardly growing one there. And I think I'll take that one and that one. And I'm going to get rid of this. So I have a branch out here that actually is in a spot of the tree where we might want to have a branch. And I talked about heading cuts previously. Well, if we want these branches here to start branching out and, and uh, getting more uh, lateral growth, we could head this right here. I'm heading it right above a bud that's pointing outward, but I would fully expect three or four of the buds below that to break. So we'll see what happens with that next year and, and we'll work on it accordingly, doing what we need to. Over here, I'm gonna do something similar. The top bud is facing outward to me. And then those two heading cuts are probably the only two heading cuts that you'll see me make on this tree. Crossing branches are another uh, problem that we wanna look for. And on this crossing branch here, you can already see some injury starting to occur. In the case of this branch, I'll just thin it out and remove the entire branch. Because there's lots of branches right here. Um, here we have a water sprout, and this one is kind of headed into an empty spot of the tree, so I think I'll leave that one. But then we have another one that is starting to rub and get in the way that we don't need. So I'm just going to go ahead and take that one out as well. So just looking at your water sprouts, you'll probably remove 90% of them, but you probably will leave a few if your tree needs some more uh, density to it. This area of the tree is a little congested in here. In general, with an apple tree, what I'll say is if you can throw a football through the crown of the tree, not that you would want to actually do this, but if it would make it through without getting stuck, the tree is probably the right density. And down here, that football just would not uh, get through there. So, I'm just looking at what I've got to work with here. I'm going to take that out and then this downwardly growing branch and alleviate some of that congestion. These are still water sprouts. Uh, they're kind of downwardly growing. They definitely need to go. So we'll take them out. And as you can see here, there was a bunch of pruning cuts. So these water sprouts were kind of a response to those pruning cuts. And I would expect that we'll get some more water sprouts over time. But as time goes on, we'll get less and less. I'm sitting here in the center of this tree, and I'm going to describe something that a lot of people do to try and make their apple trees smaller. 
And what they do is they give the tree a uniform haircut across the top. Not that what, that's what happened here, but there was a lot of work that went on at this point right here. And you can see all the water sprouts that took off from that point. So what we're going to do is we're going to take that leader back down to a thinning point down below and we're going to cut it right here. I will demonstrate the three cut pruning method on this branch here and this will take the top out of this tree. What I'll do is I'll make an undercut and I'll try and go through at least halfway and and but not allow the saw to get bound in there so it came out nice and easily now I'm going to move about a an inch or so up the stem what the undercut did is it's going to prevent the bark from stripping and making a wound that goes further than it needs to down the tree and the overcut now is going to allow me to remove all of the weight from that branch except for the little stump that was left behind so as easy as that. Oh, there we go. And the third cut will go right here. When you get to the end, go very slowly, you got a nice clean cut. So you can see this pruning wound where we removed the central leader of this out of this wine sap apple tree. And you would think that uh, a large open wound like that would be a bad thing for a plant. And you may also think that you should cover it with some sort of wound sealer or pruning paint. But that is the wrong thing to do. When you cover a wound like this with some sort of uh, waterproof sealant, really what you're doing is sealing in uh, moisture and potential disease organisms and creating an environment where those disease organisms will probably do very well. So no pruning paint. You may be wondering about this white paint on the trunks and the cooperator that we're working with here has done that to prevent sun scald on the trees. By uh, buying the least expensive interior or exterior Lasix paint that you can find and mixing it 50-50 with water, you can make a very inexpensive trunk painting paint that will uh, reflect the sun. That's it. Now, there are other YouTubes that I listed uh, that you can get. One of them is on peach and nectarine trees. Same concepts, but some different open cut areas. Um, one of them talks about safety and how to, uh, what pruning tools you need. And one thing to remember if you're going from multiple trees or even using uh, pruning shears for a plant and then fruit trees, you always want to clean your uh, equipment before you go from one plant to the next because you don't know what pathogen you might be bringing and introducing. And especially when you're cutting branches into a more of an open wound, it, it's allowing bacteria to get in there. So cleaning it with isopropyl alcohol um, and or antibacterial cleanser between each ones. I have a little bucket. I have a big bucket when I'm doing major stuff, like five gallon my big clippers to go in and I have another one that's just small from my clippers. I keep a lid on it when I'm not using it, but when I'm in the yard, when I'm done cutting something, I just stick it in there, pick it back out when I'm going to my next plant. And that might even be for flowers. Um, things like uh, eggplants, potatoes, and tomatoes um, all carry our plants that can carry a lot of pathogens in it, so we recommend that you, oh, even from one tomato plant to the next, you clean your tools. So. What about pests? Do I need to worry about spraying and all of that good stuff? Um, we take a more organic, now if you're going to spray, try to use an organic based solution. I don't want to do it. Well, we don't recommend it unless you have a problem. Okay. And that means when you are, like in the spring, 
doing some of your pruning, or maybe in the middle of the summer if the, if the tree's getting heavy, just look around and see if you see anything crawling on it. Um, the peach borer will have sap, will produce the sap, they bore a hole. Usually it's at the base of the tree, right around the ground level. And so if you see some oozing out, um, scrape the sap part away, and it could be crusted. It gets crusted when it's exposed out to the air. Uh, take a little pocket knife and move the crust away. You will see a little hole, um, and you just take a paper clip, end of a paper clip, stick it in a solution. Um, I, Waters has, um, if you go online, um, Google it or look at the extension office, it'll tell you what particular ingredient you're looking for. A little dab right at the source um, will infect the hole and kill the larva that's in there. But we don't have to be too concerned about um, the fruit itself having... Not, not for that, but so spraying a tree, mm -hmm. you're more likely to have concerns about the fruit. Right. But treating, say, a particular right. spot on the right. bark it, it should not hurt it. Right. And when you do the more organic methods, mm -hmm. you're not introducing poison at the same right. type. Right, so I would not, in growing a peach tree around here, I would, would or would not need to be concerned about dealing with pests. Can't talk about your air, your area is gonna be right unique to yourself because yeah. what's over in Prescott Cl yeah. Country Club is not the same by us. Sure. Um, for the peach tree that we've been working with, for the last five years, we have yet to spray it. Okay. Um, but we've had isolated those spots where we saw the borer, and after two years of treatment, that disappeared. Because it's usually a cycle, a year cycle also, because there could be eggs that are already planted, and they're gonna mature the next year, so you have to watch it for the following year. Well, I was really surprised that you suggested purchasing bare root. It just seems like bit more challenge to get it going, but you're saying that that's, that's a very viable um, way of it's a, it, Yep, and that's the recommended way, and most okay. people who are um, familiar with planting fruit trees will go that route. Okay. Um, I have nothing against Home Depot and Lowe's, so et cetera. If buying a tree, I'd go to Waters. Again. Yes, exactly. And then Waters actually will guarantee their, most of their trees, they have a one-year guarantee on it. Sure. So if you're going to put something for a long-term investment, go to a reputable firm. Yeah, yeah, I get and it. so other than that, um, please do watch the other YouTubes. It's, they're short, sweet, but they, they do teach you a lot of information. And where will I find the, that posted? Where do we, Prescott, it's the Prescott Valley Library. Uh, we'll post it on our web page. On the library web page? And that's all I have, unless you have other questions. Right. I'm good. And again, the extension office um, certainly is um, available to answer any other questions. Okay. Thank you. And that's it for the night. Thank you all for coming. I made it worth your trip. We're going to record anyway.